Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Today, we're going to go visit my friend Matt Collins. He is a, a logger, a sawyer, and a, a woodworker. He's going to uh, tell us about his, uh, his story and how he got to where he's at and give us a look around his operation and uh, check everything out. So I was going to say I was starting a new series with this, but technically, I've done this before. <laughs> Most notably, uh, seven years ago, I went to visit Paul Amiski. He gave us a tour of his operation, his shop there at Canadian Woodworks. And then uh, three years later, I returned. He gave us a tour of the Canadian Woodworks side and his sawmill business, Legacy Lumber. And then most recently, I went to visit Matt Rubin, and that was uh, a little over a year ago. So I've been doing this before, but I was going to say I'm starting a series because I'm going to make a more conscious effort or a more consistent effort to do these type of videos. So I've already reached out to a few people, and I have a few visits sort of pending and scheduled. There's so many people that I find inspirational, aspirational, and they're just doing plain cool stuff that I want to be able to meet and share with all of you. So that's what this is going to be. We're going to travel around and visit some folks and see how everybody got to where they're at and what they're all kind of doing. All right, I made it. This is Matt. Hey. Say hi. How you doing? <laughs> so Matt, how would you describe yourself? Would you be like, be like a logger, a sawyer, and a woodworker? Yeah, I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky guy, I guess. I don't know. Okay, I'm pretty, I'm pretty unorthodox <laughs> in what I in my methods, but I get her done. So let's start with uh, your day job, because I think that or weekday job, because I think that will kind of lead us into a lot of your story, yeah, and uh, and all of that. Maybe we'll kind of walk as we talk about that. So. Sure. Yeah, the bunchers are back there if you want to see them. There's, they're both home. We can, yeah, let's go for a walk. Okay. I'm the third generation of our tree company. The, uh, my grandpa started like a tree business and he actually cleared a lot of the elm trees in Minneapolis for the park board when the Dutch elm came through. What year was that, like in the 60s? A long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's, I think it was 70s actually, because I think I was alive. Because I, I was born in 79. But uh, yeah, and then my grandpa, and then my dad took, the company over and he mostly did like like what like house lots and stuff like that and residential so kind of getting into more large lot clear yeah well when the rat when the last recession hit we kind of got hit pretty hard mm -hmm. and that's when we joined the union and started going after all the public work and that's kind of when we blew up and got big i guess for folks who haven't seen your stuff before it's more what you guys do now is large scale land clearing I yeah guess. we do a lot of like housing developments uh you don't make much money on those because it's pretty competitive you know but our bread and butter is going after you know federally and state funded county for funded projects you know right, for roadways yeah our new roadways that's what i'm doing up north right now in aiken uh you know every 50 years they redo a road so we'll like up right right now we're doing like 20 miles of road, you know, clearing the right of way on both sides. And I hate those jobs, but that's where you make the money. So <laughs> you're doing select logging on what you're clearing then. So that can become saw logs. Yep. We use everything. I mean, I know you guys see me post videos of chipping up nice big logs, but we, you know, if, if, if it makes sense to cut a log and haul it and you can make money, then we do it. But if it's like too far away where it, you know, you can't find a home for the logs, then we try, then we try to chip it, you know, but for the most part, we use everything. So well, like right now with your job in Aiken, that's kind of far. So you are doing, are you hauling anything back? You know, there's, there's no good saw, saw logs. It's all box elder and you know, some soft, soft maple, but there's a lot of people up there that want firewood. So I've just okay. been giving them, I just give them logs, you know. So it's a good way for us to get rid of it. So, and then for the the chips, since I guess there's obviously a market for chips too, if you're actually making them. Yeah, we chip everything and we haul it to St. Paul, and it gets turned into biomass energy. And then there's a lot of erosion control guys that make those bio logs. Uh huh. Um, they they use wood chips for those too. So. Okay, so everything kind of gets some kind of use. Yeah. Even yep. if not necessarily turned into some kind of Yeah, the only lumber. thing that doesn't get used is the stump. We grind all those. Sure. But yeah, everything else gets used. You're doing that every day? Every day. <laughs> all day, every day. <laughs> uh, uh, Monday through Friday. And then like 
10, 15 years ago, my brothers bought a sawmill just for our own hobbies, you know, just to have some two by fours laying around. Because you guys were like, oh, look, we have some logs. Maybe we can cut them into something. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then it just kind of turned into, you know, a hobby of mine. And then all of a sudden I had more, more wood than I could ever use. So I started selling it. So that's actually how we met. I responded to one of your ads on Craigslist, like 12 years ago. <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> or something like that. Uh, it was for fresh sawn green wood because I figured how hard could it be to dry your own wood? <laughs> Little did you know. How I... much work could that be? <laughs> so over the years, I've been down here quite a few times hauling fresh sawn green lumber back to my house, drawing it in my basement. That's that's how we know each other. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's been an interesting adventure. Oh yeah. It's nice to see where, where you've, you know, taken it. Uh, likewise, this yeah. is a very different place than it was even oh, yeah. a decade ago. Yeah. You were probably here when the shop wasn't even built. This yet. was not here. This building was not here at all. Yeah, that was a that was a barn. The, you still had the, the silo. I pushed that over. Yep, I am. <laughs> that was fun. I wish I still had the video of that. But, but this is what we used to cut the trees down. We got two feller bunchers. So you guys aren't doing a whole lot of dropping trees with chainsaws? You know, up in Aiken, it was so wet that I thought I was going to have to swamp mat the whole thing. Oh, really? So I, and these are like 80,000 pounds, so I didn't want to bring it up there. So I just, I've been ripping everything down with the backhoe. Well, sure, if you're just chipping it or firewood or whatever, then what yeah. difference does it make? Yeah, but we got past all the wet stuff, so we're going to bring one up there on Monday. So for anyone who hasn't seen this before, tell us what the hell we're looking at. It's a feller buncher. It's kind of a goofy name. There's a big blade that spins real fast. Oh, it's frozen. <laughs> but it's got like a, I don't know, a two inch kerf, two and a half inch kerf. So this, this saw is an inertia saw, so this giant steel disc gets spun up and then yeah. you plunge it into a tree. Yeah, and there's a top plate right here so the blade doesn't get pinched. Sure. You know, but, and then these are accumulators. They have rubber bands on them so you can open it up and close and then cut another tree. That's why they call it a buncher. So yep. you can keep... You can get more than one at a time. Yep. You can go through and pick the whole... Yeah, and they have self-leveling cabs on them, so... Um, oh, is there, oh, yeah, I can there. You can see the yeah. So the rams there. If you're on a steep hill, you can still cut a tree and turn around and drop it. You know, you know if if you're at like an angle, then you'll tip over. So <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a fun day. Yeah. Now, these are kind of big standing next to them. Yeah. Yeah, we have to have uh, overweight and over width permits to haul them everywhere. So you said they're eighty thousand pounds. Something like that, pretty close. Fully loaded, I think they're at. Like 110, 120,000. With the semi and trailer? Yeah. That's, but yeah, so that's, I mean, that's kind of the same as like a full size excavator. Yeah. You would think, right? Well, these are a, a heavier than like a, our excavators. Like the ones you guys have, yeah. Yeah. I don't know anything about machines. I just uh, pretend like I do. Yeah, those are the swamp mats that we could bring up. We brought a bunch of those up there because we got to ride on them. So those are like a bunch of like eight by eights kind of banded or bolted together. You can lay down on the ground and drive on them. Yep. So you got a, uh, a mulcher here, forestry yeah. mulcher? Yep. We got like five or six of those. Like this is like an actual one. It's not like a skid steer with a mulcher attached. No, it's these... like a, it's like a real one. We've used those skid loader ones and you you got to have a good hydraulic cooler to keep it cool. <laughs> so yeah. This is our biggest chipper. It's a Bandit 2590. I think it's like 800 horse. <laughs> I think it'll take like a 25 30 inch tree i think you guys hit the cooler a little bit she's still good <laughs> and so there's your giant engine in the back there is this like remote control yeah okay yeah so like i don't see a cab anywhere no yeah there are remote controls in this box here okay so you can kind of walk along with it yep and this is the business end. <laughs> it doesn't look, I'm sure it doesn't look that big on camera, but that drum is huge. Yeah, it's pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess you're standing next to it for scale, I guess. It's, uh, it's a big machine. That'll do some work. Yeah, that's a big boy toy. <laughs> that's a mower, like a big forestry mower. It's a bigger version of the one we just saw. Yeah. And then these are one, two, three, four big stumpers that we got. 
We've got three Bandit 3500s and then a, a Vermeer FT300. This thing rips. I love it. A little bigger than those little stump grinders. That... <laughs> well, we got four of these little ones. Uh, yeah, that's not what I was thinking. And then little. we got a tiny little one. That's, over a, here. that's more what I'm thinking. That kind of stump grinder. Yeah, we still use that sometimes on like street recons. <laughs> not this. Holy no, not crap! This. Yeah, that'll chew through, through some stuff, huh? Yeah, it eats stumps pretty good. I just I love how everything's like definitely a lot more like rugged than oh, yeah. a lot of things you'll see. Yep, and we still managed to break everything. <laughs> like that one's that one's got a shield in front of the windshield, like an actual yeah grate. Well, all the windshields are Lexon, so they're all bulletproof. And I put it to the test before. <laughs> one of our guys tried cleaning the window with brake cleaner, and you can't do that on Lexon. So then we re we replaced the window. So the old one I shot with my nine mil, and it not a single bullet went through. This is my favorite skitter. It's the John Deere 848. I like that one. That's got some ground clearance. Yeah. And then we got a Tiger Cat too, but that's up on a job. Yeah, you could, you could put something in there. Yeah. This is what we use to skid logs and trees to the chipper. So the, the buncher will cut them and kind of stack them somewhere. And this thing comes by and picks up the whole stack and yep. drags it wherever it needs to go. Yep. It's like I pay attention sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, and we put chains on in the winter, and then over the summer we'll take them off. Yeah. Yeah, and you got to put them on real tight. We deflate the tires and then put them on, drat, you know, come along, ratchet strap them, and, and then you inflate the tires, and they still manage to walk off sometimes. Yeah, and these are our two smaller chippers. They're toe behind. 2590 and a 2290. Then we have another track, 2290, but that's up on a job. You want to see the grapple saw? They say you're not supposed to use it for what I use it for. <laughs> that sounds like everything for you. Yeah. But it's got a big three quarter inch chain on it. Oh my God, that's a big, that's a big chain. Yeah, it's a big chain. Three quarter. Yeah, even like the length, like how many sharpenings can you get on that thing? That's a lot of meat to... Yeah, you can, they've been sharpened a few times, but I like to use it to top you know i'll grab a tree and cut it and then lay it down <laughs> well you're not supposed to do that because it pinches the bar right. and then you're stuck in there and then you ruin the bar but i've gotten pretty good at it so i just grab it and kind of slightly pull up lop it off and then it and then i don't know i've gotten pretty good at it so it's more for like cutting logs on the ground but yeah you're, you're, just, you're topping trees yeah it's designed for cutting logs to length and you're not supposed to be vertical horizontal it. use yeah horizontal <laughs> use yep so it works pretty good for that and this one's got the regular grapple without the saw Oh, I see your scrap piles a lot smaller than last time. Was they just came and ground it. They finished hauling a couple weeks ago. It was yeah, this whole it was thing. huge last time I was here. <laughs> yeah, they come and grind it. I don't know three or four times a year, and I think uh, that's for mulch, right? Yeah, that gets turned into landscape mulch. They'll like dye it, you know, red and whatever. They really like uh, cottonwood and maple. Really for mulch? Yeah, because they can it dyes the oh, best. Oh, sure. Yeah, for so, colored mulch. That makes sense. This is the Lucas Mill cutting up a big walnut. That thing's yeah. pretty nice. Oh, that is nice. This is James. James, Matt. Matt. That's clear. Yeah. It's very nice. Okay, so at some point you decide you want to buy a sawmill to cut a bunch of of these logs. What did you get and what was that? We got an LT35 all manual. How long did that last? A couple weeks and we said, <laughs> screw this. <laughs> and then we bought an LT50. We had that for quite a while. And then we bought an LT70. Uh, I wish I would have gotten the wide option, but the, the one we ordered. Did they have that back then? Yeah, they did. Okay. Yep. But it's the super hydraulic, so it's everything's straight hydraulics and it's fast. Like, if you roll the log too fast, it'll just roll it right off the 
thing. But then we got a uh, the wood miser transfer deck and incline conveyor, and that's that's kind of a game changer because it just one one you know one guy milling and one guy just feeding them logs and you can really sure. pound out a lot them. of slab or wood. If you're doing like bigger stuff than the, than those saws back in the day, how were you cutting like giant slabs or something? I built that a pole saw. Uh, it was right here, but I had like I don't know. It was like a ten foot pole that we filled with concrete. And then I had a big arm on it, and then I had a steel 880 with like a 72 inch double double ended bar on it, and it works pretty good. You could just it would swing through the log like that, and it was I think it was 16 16 feet out, you know, and you could bolt it down, and it was pretty stable. And it's from a long time ago, so it's a bad picture. So this is the uh, the wood miser. Uh, it's kind of snowed in right now. So you have the, the saws in here kind of covered and then you've got the return or the conveyor that dumps all of the cuts out here and you can either go, you can go to either side of this table, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so, the, so all the good wood will come to this side and all the slab wood will get pushed off on the other side and then you can just come in with the skid loader and scoop it up and, and then stack lumber, my favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's kind of a lot of, I don't think most people realize like, the actual sawing part is like the quick and easy part. Yeah. It's like all the material handling and stacking and offloading. That's where all the work is. That's where it's all at, yeah. <laughs> you can you can get pretty tired offloading by hand, so this saves you a whole heck of a lot of effort. Yeah. Not having to offload every single cut every single time. Yeah, and we got the beefier version. I think it's the IC5. It can it can handle, you know, like big cans being dropped on it and stuff, but that's why I don't cut those swamp mats though. It's, it's just too hard on your equipment. You know, like 16 foot long, 10 by 10, 12 by 12. Yeah, flipping them around and rolling all over well, the place. And then it goes up the here. thing and we had it bolted to the floor, you know, but it hits it and then it sheared all of the pins off. <laughs> we were like, we're not going to do that anymore. So <laughs> well, it's kind we're, of a mess in here that. right now, but. <laughs> so this saw you've had for what, long, five years? Long time, yeah. We used to make silt fence stakes, so that's why we bought like a beefier one. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, we, we you started. Made, you started the manual one. But we started with the manual, and then we bought the, like the an manual all, giant pencil sharpener is what I call it. Yep, and then we mass produced them like like two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand stakes a year, you know. And once everything was paid off, we quit. We were like, screw that. <laughs> it ain't <laughs> worth it. So, yeah. We hit her pretty hard for a long time doing that though. That's that's kind of what set us up like milling, you know, was doing all those silt fence stakes because, you know, it was consistent, steady income you could rely on, so. That's cool. So you found a, a product that kind of worked and was consistent enough to kind of get you set up to do things you prefer to do, let's yeah. say? Yeah, I prefer to do like slabs and furniture grade lumber, yeah. you know, like, you yeah, know, there's no money in cottonwood or pine or pallet grade stuff so we don't do that anymore that, that's a volume game that's yeah, how you yeah that's totally which we could do and my brother and i have kind of thought about doing it again but i don't know well, at the cost of your mental health yeah <laughs> right yep but why don't we go inside and uh check out a couple tables because i okay. actually do woodworking too what <laughs> what been a while though <laughs> but really I'm making both. a table right now, actually. It's like a 45 inch wide, 16 foot long conference table. Oh, that's big. White oak. Yeah. Yeah, so we cut and milled and everything in this room. So this table actually came off of Prince's property in Chanhassen. Yeah, I think it's so cool. Yeah, it's got some sawdust on it. But yeah, it's insane. <laughs> and this is like a big book match walnut table I made. and. All the tongue and groove we did and everything in here. So the walls and ceiling. Yep. Oh yeah. This is a picture of the farm before it was our sawmill. Oh yeah, there's the, there's the silo and there's the, the barn. barn. The mill shed's over here. That's cool. Yeah. Because a lot of those things are some of the buildings are still here too. Yeah, all my, these things, right? Yep, that's still there. Yep. We're gonna go to Matt's shop now. Yeah. My other shop's like a mile away from here. My other shop. It's warm in here. Yeah. Yeah, I heat with wood. 
We got an outdoor boiler. I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah, just throw another log on the fire. So that's a 16 foot conference table I'm gonna make. I'm gonna butt joint two slabs. Okay. And they're like 45 inches wide. That's a lot of wood. And then these two, I'm gonna have three of these, but those will be the legs. Okay, so. yep. So while we're in here, let's talk a little bit about like what, uh, what sort of wood you sell or what, do you, is there like a certain thing you typically stock? Or you try and keep a little bit of everything? You know, I try to stay on top of black walnut because everybody <laughs> wants black walnut. So uh, I move a lot of walnut. And, but I have five quarter rough cut usually on hand. Um, I have short charcuterie boards like S2S. Um, I have thicker live edge slabs um, surfaced on two sides. Uh, kiln dried, heat treated. It's all domestic wood. I cut the trees down myself and I mill it and air dry it for two years and then I put it in the kiln. Then I bring it in here, put it on the wood whiz, plane it, throw it up against the wall and sell it. So, <laughs> and, uh, so, you, so you sell like both like just one piece slabs or someone can buy a whole yep, I bunk? Do. Yep, I have everything. So people can <laughs> come buy one slab. Um, if you buy a whole truckload, I'll do a quantity discount. But so you, yeah, so you do both live edge and edged or dimensional? You know, I, I usually have some um, dimensional walnut, but otherwise it's mostly just all live edge slabs. Oh, so. you've, you've changed in the last I know. few years then. I know. Well, that's, everybody <laughs> wants live edge. So, um, and then of course, whatever you have, it's not what they're looking for. They're, you know, they, so you, yeah, you have to keep enough on hand to hopefully meet what somebody might be looking for at some point. Yep, I try to have a little bit of everything. Sense. I'm a one man show, <laughs> so it's tough to stay on top of what I don't have. So, you know. What, what thicknesses do you typically saw um, to, or, or I guess inventory or carrier, whatever you want to call it? I usually cut everything 10 quarter or 12 quarter. Um, I prefer 10 quarter because I think you get a little more yield out of the wood, but in, after it's surfaced, it's usually about two inches thick, so okay. give or take. So it seems that seems to be the right thickness that everybody wants. So, yeah, I don't do any uh, exotics though. Minnesota exotics? Just all Minnesota <laughs> exotics. It's all it's, it's it's all stuff that I cut down myself, you know. So um, it's whatever you happen to come across out mm -hmm. there. Yeah, there's not really picking or choosing on my jobs. They, you know, we'll do like a housing development, you know, it's like 20 acres and they just set the construction limits, you know, or the silt fence stake yep. limit and we just clear everything in inside that. So in the springtime, we do a lot of like uh, um, street reconstructions. And oh, sure, yeah. so we get a lot of boulevard trees. Mm -hmm. I try, I don't really like milling those up because they're usually full of metal, but. Those are the ones I like. Yeah, yeah, so I'll give those to <laughs> those, Matt. Those are for me. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's actually something we haven't really touched on a whole lot. So to the, the scale you're doing things, technically like a lot of this is all urban lumber. Yeah. A lot it's of all it going in towards like clearing for urban development, really. Yep. We, you know, they do like stream bed um, restorations in the winter. That's a lot of good winter work in the summer. Around July, like the housing developments start hitting. And uh, in the springtime, it's usually like you know, street reconstructions, you know, every 50 years, they have to redo an entire street, all the utilities. And we go out and take out all the boulevard trees. And so, yeah, we, we do a little bit of everything, but it's all pretty large scale. So <laughs> it's a much larger scale than I do. That's yeah. for sure. Yep. Is the planer molder mat taken off? That, that's the whole reason I'm here is to get this thing. Yeah, we ran a few boards through it and that's about it. So all the <laughs> Take it, figure it out. I, I, I get to be the one <laughs> to figure out how to work it. So this is a uh, four-headed molder. So it's got four, right? Four cutter heads? Yeah. So you, the first one gets the bottom of the board. That's just a straight. And then you can do your tongue and groove on the sides. And then this is the top planer. And so it has metal rollers, which feed it better, but they'll leave marks on it. Mm -hmm. So after you go through the top pl um, planer, it has like a rubber roller, so it won't be doesn't able mar it all. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So. That's pretty slick. So in, in theory, with, with these things, th well, this is a, this is kind of a smaller one than like the, the larger, like huge industrial ones, but you'll, you stick a rough board in one end and you get fully surfaced, fully profiled piece 
Yeah. Oh, the other end. You get a fully finished S4S, like tongue and groove, you know, you can make moldy, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you can get, so you can get different cutters or cutter profiles and yep. heads and things so you can make whatever profiles or things you want mm -hmm. out of here. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Your mic is on your jacket. Oh. <laughs> it's like looking for the fuzzy thing. Yeah, so that's the Wood Whiz. It's, well, kind, is... it's kind of a stupid name, I think, for a machine. But <laughs> I can't say anything bad about it. Fair enough. Besides the name. Um, this thing's, I've had it for many, many years, and it's just been a total work ho workhorse for me. So this is a flattening sled table thing. Yep. Yeah, a router sled on steroids, in theory. Yeah. I've been planing a lot, so it's a total mess right now, but... So it's got five carbide inserts on it. Okay. Yep. They're, they're pretty cheap and easy to replace and you can rotate them. And then it has a sanding pad that screws right to the bottom of the planer head mm -hmm. so you can sand it. And then it also has this thing. It's like a big router bit. Oh, and for what, edging or straight lining? You know, I, yeah, for straight lining or um, what I do is I'd put two slabs next to each other. Oh yeah. And then, so you'd have a perfect plane, but I never use it because the track saw is just way faster. So, but it's nice to have that option. And this is, let's call it your showroom? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's my <laughs> showroom. So I air dry everything for a year or two before I put it in the kiln, because I don't, I don't have a vacuum kiln. Mm -hmm. So that thick, one, one inch, two inch lumber, you can throw in there green and it'll dry fine, but anything over two inches, like it's, an, it's a nightmare trying to dry it in a dehumidification kiln. So I just, I air dry everything till it reads 15% and then okay. I put it in there. I dry it to like four to six percent. And then usually when you plane it out, it's actually at like the accurate reading is six to eight yeah, percent. Okay, so. true. As you get close to the core. Yep. yep. Yeah. I don't know how many times you plane it out and all of a sudden it's 20% and you're like, <laughs> son of a gun. <laughs> the core, the core strikes yep. again. Lessons learned. So don't rush drying it. If it's not dry, don't use it. And so if, you, if you try to rush drying it, you're just going to mess it up or case harden it or it's not going to dry right or so. The thing that I tell people is like drying is like the, the riskiest part or the one step where you can screw up and cause the most amount of damage quickly. Yeah. Like on a sawmill, if you screw up, hey, you screw up one or two boards, uh, whatever. Break a blade, whatever. Whatever. If you screw up on the drying, it's the whole stack. It's firewood. <laughs> My favorite tool, I took a timber framing class up at the North House Folk School in Grand Marais, and I bought this bar chisel there. It's my favorite chisel, it's my favorite tool I own, and uh, every time I show it to people, they kind of laugh at me and they're like, but it doesn't have a motor on it. <laughs> you don't use stuff without motors and engines or... Where's the operator cab? Yeah, so, but my favorite chisel. So thank you so much, Matt, for Show us around and yeah, thanks for coming down, humoring me. It was fun. <laughs> I ha actually have been here a few times. I've shown a few clips of yours and me being here. Yep. Over the years, anyway, so it's cool to finally like do like a big walk around and. Yeah, a lot of around. you know because Matt's like a pretty big name, and a lot of people will be like, "Ooh, Matt Cromwell," and I'm like, "I know that guy before he was he's, famous he's a, a long body. time ago." <laughs> so. Are you this? <laughs> All right, so I'm, we're going to load this up and uh, I'll see you back at the house. See you guys. So big thank you to Matt for taking the time out of his day to show us around and uh, walk us through everything he's got going on over there. He is one of the, uh, the hardest working and most motivated people that I know. So it's very cool to uh, kind of share a little bit of a story with you. And uh, now you know who he is. This is the guy here on my shirt. <laughs> we'll be using the, uh, the four-sided molder here to make the flooring for the house. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, in the future, I'll be bringing you more of these. I have a few of them already kind of in the works and whatnot. But hopefully on a more regular and permanent basis, we'll be traveling around and meeting with and talking to and sharing the stories of so many people that uh, I have interacted with over the years. So thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments from Matt, please feel free to leave a comment and he will probably try and answer your questions as best as he can. <laughs>
Otherwise, I'll leave you a link to his website and his uh, social media and everything down below. You can check him out, follow him, and go bother him over there on his own platforms. <laughs> Thanks for watching, and until next time, happy woodworking. Wood. I'm going to do woodworking. I'm doing woodworking again.